Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 319 of the Recovery After Stroke podcast. In this episode, I'm honored to share the extraordinary journey of Steve Lawrence, who, alongside his wife, Donna, has faced the incredible challenges of stroke recovery after experiencing a hemorrhagic stroke. Steve, a drone pilot, was suddenly struck with paralysis and high blood pressure while on the job, which completely altered his life. Two years into his recovery, Steve and Donna reflect on the trials they've faced from managing sensory overload in hospital to navigating rehab during the pandemic. Join us as we delve into their powerful story of resilience, the importance of partnership in recovery, and the insights they've gained over the last two years. This is an episode you won't want to miss. Steve and Donna Lawrence, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Hi, Bill. Thank you. Thanks for being here, guys. I really appreciate it. Uh, let's start off with Steve. Tell us a little bit about what happened to you. Okay. Back on June 29th, 2022, I was at work. Um, I work for a uh, television broadcaster in Canada called CBC, and we were doing a national event. And um, my role as a videographer, camera person was, uh, I'm also a drone pilot, and I was doing the aerials for the event. Unfortunately, the event was a very sad occasion. It was a, a RCMP, which is our national police force. The member was killed back in 2020, I think it was 2020, um, during a massacre that happened here in Nova Scotia. And uh, they were finally getting around to having her funeral. And so it was nationally broadcast. And my role was to, to get the aerials for the uh, broadcast and feed it into the program. Um, it was around noon. It was a warm day. It was probably 25 Celsius, sunny. And I was, I got up from sitting down when it was, it was time, I was sitting in a chair. And then when I got up to, to, uh, to move, to get into position where I could see the drone, I noticed my finger didn't work on the buttons that I need to control the, uh, the drone with. And then my hand went. And I thought I was having heat stroke. So I said, oh, that'll, that'll go away. Sorry, sorry. Just a sec. Yeah. I, I, apologies for what I'm about to say. It was 25 degrees. You thought you were having a heat stroke? Yeah. 25 <laughs> degrees Celsius. Yeah. Well, 25 degrees Celsius, where I come from, is barely t-shirt and shorts weather do you know it's it's kind of warm okay. but not really do you know what i mean <laughs> yeah we're, we're in canada yeah. and today was a warm day we're like upper thir mid 30s it was really hot today yeah but right. okay. this was this is approaching or into summer starts in june here and yep. uh it was one of our first really warm days so i wasn't really getting used like we can get pretty warm here where we live on the east coast but um this was one of our first real warm days. It was 25, 26 Which is degrees. I guess. 77, 77 Fahrenheit. Yeah. Before I go any further, Donna is used to the heat. She's from the southern part of the United States. So everything I say in Celsius is, is Greek to her. She has yeah. no translation. Donna. She's used to 90 degrees, 100 degrees with humidity right i'm going to check in with donna i'm going to check in with donna as well right because 77 fahrenheit in melbourne australia that's like nothing right is it the same right. down in the uh, southern united states it's 77 yeah it's nice yeah it's, it's yeah. just okay yeah. yeah it's like you could get by with long sleeves <laughs> yeah if you, you had know, to just yeah. a little bit if you had to yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. It's interesting. So for me, for us hot. going through a cold, long winter, yeah, it was our first kind of warm week, and um, so I, was, I thought it was the, it was heat stroke or something, and uh, I wasn't sweating or anything, but everything mm -hmm. just started to not work, and it started with my finger and my hand, then my arm, and then I started to walk about ten steps, and then down I went. 
and I remember seeing a few things because I was very aware of what was happening. I was flying a drone and all I was thinking about was, oh my God. Oh, the drones in the air. The drones in the sky. And is there anybody around? Now with the drone, we have uh, buttons that we can push that will bring it back to its location. And I couldn't activate it with my left hand because that's the side that had the paralysis. And um, I was holding the unit with my right hand. So how am I going to, I couldn't get my hand over to it. So I collapsed and before I fell down, I remember seeing my surroundings and there was a man coming towards me and we were in a big open area, like a football field. And, um, but it was like a silhouette approaching me and I passed out and I woke up. I don't know how long I was out, maybe a couple seconds. And he was cradling me in his, like he had me, my head was in his arm. And he said, you're having a stroke. And I said, oh, I couldn't speak or anything. And um, I realized, okay, this is not what I thought it was. And he said his name was Bill. And I remember this clearly. He said, my name is Bill. You're having a stroke. I work for 911, which is our probably the same as you have there. Um, and I'm not calling them. I'm calling the guy on the hill in the ambulance because I know who that is. So he eliminated the whole system of calling through the dispatch. He just called the guy in the ambulance on the hill. And within a minute, they were outside of the event they were covering and brought me into the ambulance. But I was in and out of consciousness for some of that time and when i came to i still didn't realize what was happening the event was a, a parade of rcmp officers who were in their uniforms and i don't know if you ever so, saw tell me RCMP. The rcmp tell me about it i think i might have but just tell me what yeah. that stands for well they're, they're called the royal. Canadian royal royal canadian mounted police yeah so I, back I in them. the day they used to be on horses yeah and they wear red uniforms mm. and um they're, they're very distinguishable if you see one you'll know yeah. that's what they're, they're RCMP. some of them though were dressed in military fatigues camouflage and were carrying their weapons and these weapons were used um for some of this this story that uh, we were covering that was the funeral for this was a situation that involved police action with these military weapons and when i woke up i thought i got shot by one of these guys wow. that was my first instinct because they were reaching down to pick me up and i said was i shot and they they were laughing and they go no no and someone tried to offer me a bottle of water and bill swatted it away and he said, no, no, he's having a stroke. You can't give him anything because mm. he could aspirate. and Worse things could happen. So mm. I was very, very lucky that that had happened to me. But I still wasn't processing what was happening to me. When you were dealt with after Bill managed to get the right guys over from the hill, you woke up in hospital. Did you end up in hospital after that very quickly? Yeah, I um, I did a couple of things before that. I, um, I started getting sick. And um, before that, though, they, they were taking my clothes off. And I said, get my phone. But I had to land the drone. Right? I, I still had that in my head. I had to land the drone. And I remember taking the, the controller and pushing the button with my face. <laughs> along like that. And I guess it landed because someone on my crew retrieved it. Part of my crew also was listening to me. I had a headset on so I could speak to my spotter and I was speaking to somebody in the satellite truck. And Emma, who was in the satellite truck came out and I handed her my phone and I said, call Donna. And I don't know Donna's phone number. Donna's got an American phone number that I always just push one. <laughs> it's automatic. And, but I remembered it. I went, 
four, two, three, da, 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 da. And I couldn't, like, I don't know how I knew that. Having a stroke and, and all this happening, I, it just came out of me. She called Donna. Uh, Donna was home watching the program and she knew, and she can tell you the, this part of it. If you've had a stroke and you're in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind. Like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously you've never had a stroke before. You probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called seven questions to ask your doctor about your stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide. It's free. Okay, I was watching, um, they were doing a live on it on uh, Facebook and I was sitting there and I was watching it and I could tell that the drone wasn't quite angled right. I'm a photographer too, so I, I kind of know those angles. So I was like, put it down, lower it down. You know, you're know, you not you're not doing it right. And I was talking to the phone like he was hearing me, but I thought something's not right. That's not, it just didn't look right. You know, that's not his shooting. So. And then the phone rang and it was Emma calling her. And Emma how said. How does that phone call me. go, Donna? How does that phone call go? You, you answer the phone, it's Steve's number. Yeah, well, I was already kind of a little flustered that the angle of the camera, and I, I thought maybe something's happened to the drone. Maybe it's having you know problems with it. But um, she called and she said, "There's been an incident. Um, Steve is okay, but we're going to uh, put him in an ambulance. He's going to go to the hospital." And I said, "What do you mean he's okay, but you're taking him to the hospital?" It just didn't make sense. So then I was like okay you know and then the adrenaline started and so i started packing a little bag like a little overnight bag because i said something may not be right so it wasn't yeah and, and now did, i don't have, I'm sorry and then did you shoot off to meet him at the hospital is that the intention of the phone call was it to get you to go there yeah at that that particular day the car he had taken the car to work so I didn't have a car and it was probably about 20 minutes into the city. So um, they had um, made some phone calls, Emma did, had made some phone calls back to the station, which the station got the anchor to come to the house to pick me up because he knew where we lived. And um, he drove me over to the hospital and we had gotten there probably about 10 minutes after they had arrived with Steve. What kind of person are you when there's an emergency. I, I know there's certain people I wouldn't call in an emergency. It's like, all right, call that person. Don't call that person. Call that person. Avoid that person. Are you cool, calm, and collected when it comes to that kind of stuff? Or are you, are you do you take things difficult? Is it hard for you to sort of over, overthink about what's happening? No, I was just, okay, I, I got to get the bag. I got to get a purse. I got to do something with the dog. It was just like, I knew that it, things had to be done and not to jump to conclusions because I didn't know what was happening. So that was pretty, um, looking back on it now, I took it very calmly, mm. you know. Um, You're on my so, call list then. And yeah. Be, because of that, it, it saved me. Because when I got in the hospital, I still had no idea what was happening to me until mm. I got through the main doors and there was a neurologist there mm. and he was doing this. How many fingers do I have? And can you see me over here? Can you see over here? And somewhere in the mix, Donna was standing off to the side and I saw her and she was not freaking out. And they had told her that he had a stroke. We didn't, I don't know at the time, did we know it was hemorrhagic? We did. So they were kind of narrowing it down to where it was, what kind of stroke it was. But when I saw Donna, 
I just, I went, oh, I'm, I'll be fine. I'll be okay. She was fine as kind. So if she's calm, you're calm. And then yeah. that that's a good kind of patient to be. It's good to be calm because then the doctors yeah. can deal with the situation, not with somebody who's freaking out as well as the situation. Right. right. And I didn't really worry because I never had any health problems in the past other than self-inflicted pain from breaking bones and mm. wiping out. And, and I don't have any, I didn't know. Um, and was there any, now reflecting back, was there any signs that you think, oh, maybe that was the issue giving me some warning signs? Was there anything like that? Yeah. Yeah, there was times when we were doing things that I would get really sharp pains in my head. And I would mention it to Don. I'd say, ow, oh, that, that was weird. It was just like someone took a hammer to a metal plate. Ding, and it was it zingers. And it was always on, that side. It was on this side of my head, yeah. The stroke happened. It was intracerebral hemorrhage. It happened on the right. But everything on my left pretty much went paralyzed. Um, and so if I was to look back and see if there were any signs, that might have been something that was saying, hey, but it was all during this pandemic and we didn't have doctors to go to. It was just phone calls. I never was hooked up to a blood pressure machine in years. I didn't have someone checking me other than a phone call. And I was, well, try Not taking enough. the Tylenol, Not stuff enough. like that. Yeah. Oh. So what was the underlying cause, Steve? What did they discover caused the bleed? It was high blood pressure. Um, in my case, it was extremely high. It was, I wrote it down because I'm 212 over 105. So all I knew before strokes that 120 is the number you're supposed to be in and around. If you get too low, then you could faint. If you get a little higher than that, you might, whatever. But 212 sounds like a really really high number and in my case it was how long has it been going that way could have been years i don't know um i never knew but high blood pressure does run in my family this came out afterwards that i found out that my my mom and my brothers have it but it, it wasn't something that they didn't have a stroke it was just take pills and manage it mm. It's often um, made worse by smoking or drinking. Were you a smoker or a drinker or anything like that? Overweight? I'd have the odd beer, odd beer like once a week with my buddies, but it would that would be it. Just one or two, no smoking. Mm. Never. And so how old were you when you had the bleed? How old yeah. were you when that happened? I was 56, and uh, that, that, that was when it happened. Um, and as far as you knew and everybody else knew, looking at you, everything looked and seemed okay. And you didn't have any concerns about your health prior to that, say, and and have regular contact with doctors or GPs or anybody? No. Nope. Uh, even when I did go to the doctor before the pandemic, um, things kind of changed. Uh, the hands-on stuff wasn't... Um, the same um it was kind of you'd go in you you spend 10 minutes in the office and then next mm -hmm. um i had did some injuries to myself from work with my back um and my shoulder i had broken that and um then that was just referred off to a specialist so mm -hmm. but, but as far as related stuff going, to blood pressure or any of that stuff no no, no nothing like that so when i heard mm -hmm. That I had a stroke it was like now my grandmother she was a hundred she almost made it to 102 and she was having TIAs mm -hmm. but she'd go to the hospital and be back home for supper <laughs> right and I thought okay that's what's gonna happen to me um and then one of the funny things that comes out of this is the doctor neurologist asked me as he was leaving he said is there anything you'd want to know do you have any questions and i said yeah um donna and i are planning to go down to tennessee in in uh, august or september so a couple more months will i be able to drive down there and he just looked at me and said 
you young man are not going to be driving for many calendars. That 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 if that didn't give me a stroke, then I, I don't know. It was it was like, what does that even mean? They're not going to be driving for many calendars. So I I went back and then tried to process that. Like, is this really going to be that bad? And it wasn't really until later, I think that week I was, or maybe that day, I was laying in bed in the emergency, and it must have been that day, and I kicked my left leg, and I didn't know it was me kicking my left leg. I couldn't feel it. And I said, who's in bed with me? But this, that, that sounds funny, but- Because your right leg knew that you hit something, but yeah, your left leg I wasn't talking it. back. But I was looking mm -hmm. around to see who's in bed with me. Now I didn't lose any perception of vision mm -hmm. or speaking. It was mostly just physical, um, very like limp, uh, no feeling at all. So when mm -hmm. I kicked it, didn't know it was my leg. I was kicking. Yeah. I can relate to that. I still have that issue uh, 12 years later it's not um it's not like i completely don't know it's like there's not enough information coming back to my brain to say your leg is in the wrong position so often if we go out to dinner and you know you sit on those tables with lots of people and sometimes there's a table leg in the middle of where you are because you're at the table leg part of the mm -hmm. um seat and then I'll, I'll go to shift over to the left to get out of the table or to the right and my leg will be stuck where the leg my leg will be stuck at the table leg and i'll be trying to move and i won't know that my leg is there and i won't be i won't be able to take to slide and i'm just trying to work out oh why am i not sliding ah okay i look down and my leg is stuck behind the table leg so it still happens and um it's very weird it's still something i haven't completely gotten used to um i still go into automatic mode when i i think about trying to get up from the table and walk away donna what's it like when you go to the hospital and you receive the news that your husband has had a stroke like what's it like to be a spouse and receive that information uh and when i say spouse I, what i mean is like to see the person that you love on the other side right. of the bed in that state what, what what was that experience like um it was so funny because I, I guess the adrenaline at that point had went away and strength came and I knew that I had to be the pillow of and I say the pillow because he had to lean on me I mean I had to be that person for him that was going to keep him happy keep him smiling keep him lifted not worry about anything take one day at a time the role i think that the caregivers play is really important like steve said earlier a it's important to be calm it's important to be able to step up and say you know i we've got this you can lean on me i'm going to be able to help you through this um even if it's not true even if you don't know that that you can do it it's important to be able to at least say it in that time and then if yeah. you can pull it off, that's great. If you can't pull it off, then it's important to get the resources around you guys to support each other so that you both have support in that situation. And as far as you had known, had you ever dealt with anybody who had had a stroke before or known anybody or met anybody? Uh, yeah, probably, um, I don't know, maybe 25 years ago, my dad had two strokes, two ischemic strokes. Um, he has affected his speech, but with rehab within a few months, he was okay. So his was not severe, but it was, you know, it was severe at the time, but it, it, he got through it. Um, so that was the only person that I knew of that had had strokes. And I had never really heard of anybody having a hemorrhagic stroke. I mean, like, tell me more. Mm -hmm. What does this mean? You know, and it was the big brain bleed in the center of the brain that they couldn't do anything. They just kind of just let it go. Yeah. Let it heal uh -huh. itself. Right. Okay. So uh, obviously they medicated Steve. They've given you the blood pressure medication. They've realized that it was high. That would have brought 
your blood pressure down at some point and stabilized it. And then they just let it heal and monitored it, Steve. Yeah, there was no snow going in and stopping it, which was kind of scary when you, I thought about it. But they, they did, I remember say, if we go in, it'll do worse damage by cutting your head open and going in and try to clamp it off or whatever. There was no drug that they could give us, whatever that drug that a shot uh, that would be for the, that's for clots. They said yeah, yours TPA. is bleeding. TPA yeah. for clot busting. Yeah. Not, nothing that they could do. So we're going to let it bleed out. And so I remember there was a number that I heard later that I had a 30% chance of making it. 33 or 30%, something like that. So I, it didn't hit me. I didn't go, oh my God, this is my last moments. Mm. I didn't, didn't clue in. But looking back on it, I went, wow. I was close to the end mm -hmm. and I didn't know it. It too is, um, it's kind of like the old saying, you got to be in the right place at the right time. If he had been on a shoot, say three hours from here, which that's a common occurrence, um, maybe on the coast and, and two to three hours away from a hospital, yeah. much less than amulets. I mean, the outcome would have been a lot worse. Yeah, the job I had, I was never in in, in the city. Usually I, I'm, a, in, I'm in the sky, I'm on the water, I'm in the woods, I'm far away from my base, I'm traveling. Um, and this, it's clearly this not a around paramedics who are on standby just over the hill. No, Can you believe and to it? be scooped up by a guy who knows nine one one, and you know, it, it it's all like intervention stepped in, and I never really looked at it like that until afterwards. Like the blessings in life that kept yeah. us alive, kept kept me alive, and having Donna in my life. Donna was not working; she moved up from the United States. Um, her family's still down there and she moved here for me and she was a homemaker and we were able to live on my income and I would come home every day and everything was perfect. Um, now I'm in the hospital and she was able to come in every day before I woke up. She was there. When I went to sleep, she was there every day. Yeah, that's very useful, isn't it? It's very helpful when somebody when you wake up and things are weird and scary and you don't know what's happening and then there's a calming voice in the room with you just checking in making sure that everything is okay how how did you play that role donna what did you feel like your role was oh my role was just to be like i've always been to him but kind of amped up the little volume a little bit because i had to do everything i mean i was for weeks, I had to feed him. He couldn't, he couldn't function, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, I took the role of a lot, a lot. And the nurses saw me come in and there, it was almost like a calming effect to them. They're like, oh God, good, she's here. So it's like, there's one patient that I don't have to do everything for because she's here. Right, okay. And so he couldn't point. eat, he couldn't eat. Uh, at that no. stage, couldn't get up, couldn't move any of the left side. No. They had to hoist him. They've got one of these things, and I wish I knew the, the crane. For it. <laughs> they they would they would scoot this little thing under him, and they would hoist him up and bring him over and drop him in, not drop, but well, placed him in a wheelchair. And then I took the role of pushing it. You know, we, we would go on walks and things. Yeah. Um, we, we didn't get to stay out very long because it, it then was hot. And then he just was very fatigued, very fatigued. Yeah. And I wasn't walking. I was in the chair. Yeah. But uh, I was a bit bigger than I, I am now. I'm down to what I should have been, I guess, in weight. But I was 222. 222. Uh, pounds. 511. Yeah, moved 511 and a bit. Um so now I'm down to 180. I just checked before I came in. Um, and that's where I was most of my life. But 
I think as when I turned 50, I, I started putting on a little more weight and I uh, wasn't paying attention. Um, yeah. Diet and... was a big thing. Um, eating on the road, a lot at work, you don't sitting, you're not coming home, you're, you're traveling, you're just going to eat where you can, you eat at your desk, you, you're, you're inhaling whatever you can get. Mm. So and a lot of things, work was, uh, my stressful? work was very stressful, but I didn't really pay attention to it mm. being stressful. Just a quick break, and we'll be right back with Steve's remarkable journey. But before we continue, I wanted to remind you about my book, The Unexpected Way That a Stroke Became the Best Thing That Happened. It's not just a collection of stories. It's a guide on how to achieve post-traumatic growth after stroke. The concept of post-traumatic growth or PTG was first coined by Dr. Richard Tedeschi and Dr. Lawrence Calhoun in, the, in 1995. And my book builds on their groundbreaking work. In it, I share my own recovery journey and those of others who turn their challenges into powerful opportunities for growth. If you're looking for practical, science-backed steps to move forward after stroke, this book is for you. You can grab your copy on Amazon by typing my name, Bill Gassiamas, into the search bar, or head over to recoveryafterstroke.com slash book. So it's high, it. it's high um, intensity, right? Because... It's about getting the right shot, the right time, being at the right place, all that stuff. It's all about getting it back to the station as quickly as possible. Um, it, it's forever changing, especially in a scene like that where there's people everywhere and a parade to focus on. It's just constant. And it's not about you, really. It's about the footage. So everyone yeah. puts a lot of effort in. I interviewed a reporter a few years ago mike smith and he was telling me that his hours were just ridiculous um as a reporter he was working all hours and every hour of the day and he had no life other than work because it was so consuming so over the top consuming um yeah. that's what was happening to me and i didn't realize it until after i had my stroke and look back and say but i was working eight to ten hours a day at work now I was coming home. Donna's been sitting here patiently all day waiting for me. She's got supper ready. She's taking care of the house and taking care of all of our affairs. And she just wants to have a conversation. How was your day? And I take out the laptop and I continue working. I'm mean, taking in stuff I wasn't able to finish at work. Yeah. And doing it at home. So making sure everybody at work has got all the stuff they need. And I never stopped. I never turned it off. And there are a lot of people at work that are still like that. And um, it was a wake up call to a few of my friends that have are in similar situations with uh, workflow. And they went, Whoa, <laughs> it's brutal. And they smoke and they drink and they live different lives. But yeah. work yeah. is a big, was a big thing. Yeah. So when you, woke up with all of the deficits uh you can't eat you can't walk what was the rest of the process like did you do rehab how long was that for and where was that okay so the hospital i was in was uh, in the city and in for donna every day she would come in and she had to learn how to drive my car because my car was a uh, manual standard we call them uh, six speed mm -hmm. and she did that she did it pretty good um my uh, hospital stay was five weeks i think but it was hell on earth it, I, to be blunt i like i thought i was gonna die there because of the noise all the confusion going on and mm -hmm. there was a man that died next to me the night after I got in, he had passed away from a stroke and was still there the next morning when Donna walked in. And the, all the commotion of everything going on, the beeps, the buzzers, the noises, the smells, I didn't think I was going to make it. And Wow. So it was that intense. The sensory overload was that intense that oh. you felt really unwell about it. That's so interesting because... Um, Obviously, lots of stroke survivors, brain injury survivors comment about the sensory overload from 
light, yeah. sound, and all that kind of stuff. And you're in a hospital where you're meant to be cared for and looked after. Nobody's considering that side of it for you at all, are they? They're just not tuned not into really. how much harder it is to experience all that sensor sensation with an injured brain. No, they would come in in the morning and, and it was a routine, but they turned the lights on and the buzzers mm. all night long. People were moaning and groaning and some were, were in different re, for different reasons. And, but I found out that I was going to go to rehab, which was another building down about five minutes away from the hospital. And it was just like waiting for, to get that call. Let's say we got a bed. And um, once that day happened, it was like I won the lotto. And they, you're out of there. They, I was out of there, but it wasn't that easy. But I'll get to that in a second. They, he typically when, uh, or typically when they have a stroke at this particular hospital, um, they'll bring them from the ER straight up to um, a certain floor that's called the stroke floor because that is the unit that they particularly are just fully involved in strokes. So, so um, there's there was a lot of patients. And at that time, even that was kind of mid-COVID, I would say, um, there was a lot of COVID patients in there that also had had a stroke. And it was just, it was kind of scary because you've seen all these signs saying COVID dress up, you know, you had to put on all the little mask and the, um, what do they call it? The gowns and things that mm. that doctors had to put on to go into the room. Um, so that was scary because I thought uh, I'm going to come out of here with COVID, and then I won't be able to see him. Yes, yeah. my she heart goes person. out to all the COVID era patients of oh. any illness because I heard so many of those stories where people had their stroke condition situation made even worse by all of the challenges that were related to that i can't imagine what that would have been like we went through a lot of tough times for over three brain uh brain hemorrhages brain surgery um my mother-in-law passed away at the uh, a week or two before my brain surgery so we had to have the funeral and then brain surgery and throwing a pandemic into the mix I can't imagine like how much harder that would have made the whole situation, which was already terribly hard. Right. I mean, a stroke is a new thing, you know, especially if you've never had one or had any, any person around you that had one. So going through that and learning how to cope with that. And then plus the pandemic that that was totally, what do you do? You know, it, it was just a lot of scary things, a mm. lot of scary things. And mm. Donna was the only person I had the connection with. Like the doctors and stuff were just so overwhelming. But without Donna there every day, I, I had would, to be the advocate. Yeah, she really did have to do things for me. And uh, yes, the advocate is an important role under normal circumstances. But when the doctors and the nurses are run off their feet even more so than they normally are because of the stuff they got to deal with with the pandemic, then it stays easy forgotten like easily I know. forgotten and, and you have to um and and it would still be if, if something happened today and the pandemic was not going on i mean it's still a little bit but mm. um you got to be on top of what the doctors or the nurses are telling you. you you got to either take notes or try to remember it because i caught two or three nurse practitioners and nurses that told us one thing and then the next day told us another. And I'm like, no, you told me that the numbers are, you told me this medicine was for the, you know? And so it was like, I wasn't trying to correct them, but correct me if I'm wrong, what I need to believe, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's really important. It yeah. Steve, um, you finally get out of the hospital ward and then you're going into rehab. Tell me about the rehab experience. What was it like to, really first for the first time in a long time like not be able to use any of your left side yeah so um it was during the hospital stay that i realized that i can't stand up on my, by myself i had to get the crane 
pick me out of bed, put me down. And then they tried to do some rehab in the hospital. When I went um, out in the hallway to walk, I collapsed, but they caught me. I was, able, but what I found out I did was, um, what's that nerve? The vagus nerve. The vagus nerve. Uh -huh. Is that something you ever heard of? Yeah, the wandering nerve. It's the nerve that connects all your organs. Every yes. single part of your body is connected to the vagus nerve. Yes. Well, I triggered that and boom, down I went. They were there to hold me. But it was, a, it, I, I had that happen to me a couple of times. And mm -hmm. I thought, oh my God, if every time I stand up, this is going to happen. It can't go on. And so what uh, happened? But, okay. like, what did you feel? You just all, you just lose all control. Every uh, like your, switches your, off. Like, your bodily functions, your, your muscle tone. Your, it's like you faint. Yeah, it's like a faint, yeah. Ah, uh, right. You okay, completely switches off. Yeah. So we get into, I get the word that I'm going to the rehab. Yay. They packed me up and that took uh, about a day to get everything coordinated. And we go over there and the rehab building, I've been in it before for doing stories that I have uh, done in the past about people who've had injuries that needed rehab. And I knew it was a really good place. Um, but where I was going to be in a room, it was institutional. Like, um, I felt like I was coming from one bad place and going into another. And I got in a room with four guys and there was, there was no quiet. I was thinking, this is where I'm going to get some rest. And this is what I need for my head. And the guy next to me was from the middle East. I think he was from Afghanistan. Um, Another guy on the other side was local, and the guy across from me was dying of something that I don't know if he he survived, but when I he was moaning and groaning, and I don't know if he had a stroke, he had something else. But it was the guy next to me on this side who was calling his family in the Middle East at three o'clock in the morning, which <laughs> I'm supposed to be dead asleep, and he was yelling because I think he thought he had to scream. To make them here the connection might not have worked or whatever no, but... that's just um just so you know like when my family talk to people overseas they do talk a bit louder it's just to make their voice travel somewhere quicker or something i don't know like it's to hit the satellite better i don't know why but the voice <laughs> goes up and also if you're from one of those kind of backgrounds you you're born with a voice that's louder just by default you're about you know, 20% louder than the normal person, right? And mm -hmm. you're, and often, Steve, you piss people off, right? So I do that. Like I have a normal conversation with my wife and she says, why are you yelling? And I'm like, Dude, we're just talking. We, I, yeah. I haven't yelled yet. And um, <laughs> that's, that's all he was doing. He was just being normal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I realized that. But at but, three in the morning, it's but, tough. That was yeah, amazing. but my brain was really having a hard time with all the different noises and sensations. Um, and he couldn't speak English very well. And so he was, when he wasn't talking to them, he was on his iPad or on his uh, tablet, listening to children's programming. So he was like Dora the Explorer, or it was, a, it was a riot when you think about it, but he was learning how to speak English through these children's programs. I love it. And so all I hear in the morning, are, well, Teletubbies or whatever it was, or Dora, oh, Dora, Dora, it. the Explorer, and he was he was repeating this, and I'm like, oh, good God, help me, take me out of here. <laughs> and my work plan that I have pays for a semi-private room, so Donna was right on that. She's like, why is he in here with four people? Like, can we get a? Nope, you're lucky you got a bed. So true that we yeah. were lucky we had a bed. So the first week I'm in rehab, and I'm they get me out of bed and they get me down to the, the gym that they have there. And I meet the lady who's going to teach me how to walk again. And um, she's been at it 30 some years. She's about five foot zero. And I thought there's no way she's going to hold me up. There's no way. And they did a video and it's incredible. Like to see me make my first steps again with her right behind me every 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 bit of the way um but the rehab is where i i uh, 
started to make gains and um, with the physical stuff. Um, my, my left leg was gone. I couldn't move my arm for quite a long time. Um, so your left leg is at what situation now? My arm? My left I have your really left leg. Bad. Oh, I can walk. Um, oh. It's But I, I worked really hard to get my mobility back. Um, and I thought I was doing it too fast because I was getting a lot of pain. And I was saying to them, is this what, I never had a stroke before, so I don't know. Is this is normal to have this pain? And they're like, well, oh. and then they start poking me with different things and thinking, mm, it, it'll go away. We'll give you some pills. And so they loaded me up with, I had to write it down, amitriptyline, gabapentin, Cymbalta. Cymbalta. And uh, that was the worst one. That just made me a zombie. It was bad. And the it pain didn't go away. Wiped you out. Yeah. Pain didn't go away at all. Um, but um, I still had the pain and I'm taking all this medicine and I'm just, I wake up after sleeping and I want to go back to bed again. Yeah. Fatigue was huge. Yeah. Um, but the rehab, I ended up getting, I don't know if Donna was behind this, but she kept saying, like, he gets a private or gets a semi-private yeah, room. Not to the um, head guy. Yeah, the head, the head dude. And one day, a nurse came in, and she just started grabbing all my stuff out of the room. And I thought, uh-oh, we pissed somebody off. And then I'm going back to the hospital. <laughs> and they, they literally wheeled me out of the room in my bed. Like, I'm still laying in bed, waking up, like, what's going on? And she puts me into this, I thought it was a closet. And it was my own bed, my own room. My own, and she said, no, you're going to have this now. And it I was went, tiny. Yeah, and I, I didn't care how big it was, but I yeah. could close the door and I could shut everything out. And so the last five weeks of rehab, I had a private room. That's so And good. it was good too because Donna yeah. could come into the room where when at the hospital, she could come in, but at rehab, she couldn't because it was too shared with other people. Yeah, yeah, too many people. Ah, oh, that's so good. I remember also having all of those troubles in the hospital ward and then going into rehab and having my own room in rehab. It was such a relief. It's where I actually rested. It took, you know, a good two or three weeks to actually rest. And I was in rehab for four weeks. So even though they were fatiguing me when I was trying to learn how to walk again and all that stuff, at least I could go into my room and there was no buzzers. And there was no people whinging and moaning and talking to Afghanistan at three in the morning. It was just mm. me. And it was so good to have that space. Um, it's where I think most of my recovery, uh, why most of my recovery was possible. Uh, definitely why. Um, tell me about the Michael Jackson glove that you're wearing. Yeah, really. <laughs> um, well, this is back to the pain. Um, they still haven't gotten to the bottom of it. And it wasn't until about couple months ago they thought because most of the pain i have is in my butt right in my butt kind of deep in the cheek and then down behind my leg in my calf and then right into my foot and they thought it's your sciatic nerve and then why is this hurt shoulder my shoulder and my arm and it wasn't until i went to an orthopedic surgeon who was a second opinion they were going to cut me open and, and do a disectomy on my spine because what's i do that? have what's that well where your vertebrae are in between you have um uh -huh. bulging discs they take the they take the vertebrae and, and take it out and put an artificial one in uh -huh. and it hopefully takes the pressure off of the um the nerve the the uh, the bulging part of the, the nerve, yeah. Um, I do have that based on an MRI. It's, it's very slight, but one doctor said it could be really slight, and it's like a, a hangnail on your hand. It, it feels like your finger's amputated if you get, it gets too bad, but it could be really bad, and you don't notice it. So I'm going to get you a second opinion. And the second opinion orthopedic guy said, 
you know what? He said, have you talked to your neurologist about this? And I said, neurologist? I haven't seen a neurologist since the moment I walked in the hospital. He said, what? And I said, no. He said, he wrote a referral right away. He said, I'm going to get you to see her. You need to see a neurologist. He said, what the pain you have has nothing to do with this. It's, it's um, C central post stroke, stroke pain. That's what he thought it was. And um, so that's when I started looking into that more. And that's how I come across your videos and other people. I'm like, what is this thing called central post-stroke pain? I saw that uh, 60 Minutes in Australia did a feature on a woman. And so then I really started get, digging deeper. And I've, I've found you. I found other people. I've talked to people that have had the treatment in Florida for yeah. different things. We'll talk about a tennis step in a second. Um, post stroke pain is so common. I've met people on the podcast who have opted to have a foot amputated to get rid of the pain. It's that yeah, that's what I it's... dramatic. Sarah Curley, um, that interview was stunning because I just couldn't believe who I was going to interview and why I was going to interview her, and then. If you uh, watched that interview or if you heard Sarah talk about it, there has been no better decision that she has made in her life than to remove her foot. And the pain went away. And wow. she's just a massive advocate for it. And I was like, I can't, I can't wrap my head around it still, but I also have never been in the amount of pain that Sarah must have been in. Now I get left side pain and my foot is always kind of stiff and tight. The ball of the foot kind of always aches. Um, my left hand aches, but I've never had to take painkillers. I can almost ignore it. Um, if I focus on something else, it kind of, it's not in my mind. Um, and then I've had people reach out to me because they heard Sarah's interview and said, can you put me in touch with Sarah? Because I think I need to go after that particular solution as well. So uh, I, end up, I don't know what it's like, but I can appreciate that uh, people after stroke do experience pain. A friend of mine has a daughter who experienced a stroke when she was 17, uh, brain hemorrhage as well. And everything was going well and her recovery was doing great. And then at around about the seven or eight month mark, she started to feel pain. And what they were saying was as the brain started to heal and started to come back online, um, things were settling down. But one of the things that was triggered for her to feel as other things started to settle down was the pain that was um, there. And it's kind of, um, and it's not, it's not, this is the hard part about it. It's actually not real because it's not, yeah. the pain is not saying, um, warning, you've done something to injure yourself, do something about it. It's just like a, a an incorrectly wired part of the brain now that's triggering the pain mechanism for no reason that's urgent that you need to take care of. It's just accidentally kind of switched on and now it's a case of how do they switch it off. So I can appreciate it and um, – I'm really surprised. I'm, well, I'm not during COVID. I'm not surprised that you didn't end up seeing a neurologist during that era. But um, it's often I speak to stroke survivors who have not seen. Uh, well, I didn't see many people I even during my visits to the hospital over the three years that I was um, going through it. Because my incidents were on again, off again. There, there wasn't. There was too many people involved in my, uh, in my acute presentation. So when I was there experiencing the bleed, I would get treated, etc. And then they'd be like, "Okay, we're going to monitor you. Catch you later. See you later." But they never said, "What are your deficits or what are your cognitive issues or any of that stuff?" They just treated the bleed and then sent me home. So I, we had to do the same thing. We had to find out who else do we need to speak to? Like, What else can I do to make this better? Who else do I have to follow up with? We were just 
it was just missed. It was just one of those things, you know, and it wasn't even during a crazy pandemic period. It was, mm. I would say, in one of the best times to be um, unwell in a hospital in Melbourne. Things were great. Uh, but but it's good that you guys have worked it out and you've continued to advocate and get second opinions and keep asking questions and being curious, searching for more information online. That's the reason why the podcast exists because I was lacking a lot of the information that Stroke Survivors still lack. So it was like, what? How do how do I do that? Is I put it out there, caregivers. It's important for caregivers as well so that they can navigate how to support their loved one and how to advocate on their behalf in the hospital when their loved one can't advocate. Um, yes. So the way I came across a Tanacept was in the very early uh, years of my recovery and immediately it, sp it triggered that hope, that spark for hope. Oh, okay. So I haven't been there yet and I really would love to go and see Dr. Tobinick. Um, and first, what I had to get out of my head was whether or not it was legitimate or not, because there was a lot of terrible um, talk about what he does over there. Even after the 60 Minutes interview that was done now, I'm pretty sure it was done around nine years ago here in Australia about um, mm -hmm. his particular treatment. And I, I am not in a position to raise the money to travel from Australia to Florida uh, to get the injections to come back to do all of that. I'm not in that position yet. And I am not in the kind of pain where I have to 100% try and get it sorted because, like I said, sometimes I can not notice how my left side feels if I'm distracted enough by the tasks that I'm doing, whatever. So when you found the interview, how did you react? What do you think about uh, that when you see something like that, when you're experiencing the kind of um, challenges that you are? Well, the, the fact journalist in me needed to know more. Uh -huh. And I did the research. And first person I would talk to about was Donna. I said, Which, let's watch this. Look at this. This might be what I need. And it's about what three months, four months ago. Could have been, yeah. Donna didn't really. She she's more familiar with how things go on in the United States with the healthcare system, and she had a lot more skeptical moments about it. She's like, oh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, but it wasn't until in the last couple months I've actually been in contact with people who've had. The treatment the lady that had aphasia uh, mm -hmm. she was on the 60 minute story um, i tracked wow. her down and wow. and she called me she called me uh and we had a talk with her about, about two a month, ago. a month ago for a good hour and she said not the same thing she said i was skeptical i thought that was the way my life was going to be but they had the means to be able to travel down and try it and well, you see the result. It worked in the video. Um, then you go online and read a little more, and there's a lot of skeptical, like, oh, that's just witchcraft, or those people are actors. or the, And I'm like, no, this is real. I know the pain. And when they were getting down to, like, the details of, like, my teeth hurt on my left side, like, when I chew, how would they know that? In your taste. The taste, the detail of my fingernails feel like they've been all chopped off. That that detail of pain, how can someone else know that? Right. And they've had this treatment, and um, one of the guys that uh, just came back last week from there, he, I think he was commenting on in your group, on your podcast, and on YouTube. And, and he said, I'm going down in July. And I replied, I'd let us know how it goes because at that point I was really looking into it and um, the end of July happened last week and I sent him a, a, a note underneath his comment I'm going down in July and he said I'm just on my way back I have lots to say about it and I went oh right on this is what I want to hear I want to hear this 
found out the guy lives an hour away from me and <laughs> we talked on the phone yeah the other day <laughs> this guy is um done his homework he's a lot he's a high level paramedic who's researched everything he studied all the journals all the medical stuff had the discussions with his family and people and said we've got the means let's let's make it see if it works yeah. and he's he's noticed a difference um and like we all have different deficits mine um people look at me and go wow you had a hemorrhagic stroke and you're walking and you're moving and i'm like but i wasn't two two years ago but i have a lot of residual issues the pain mm. you can't explain that to somebody no like donna sees it in me she sees the fatigue but mm. i still cannot and so you asked about the glove earlier yeah. this is maybe it's in my head but it's a compression glove and it's it's helping with the nerves it's not um, in your head no it's legitimate <laughs> it really is and sometimes i wear the sleeve that goes right up here and it helps yeah. and i don't i have one for my leg it, it it knocks it down a bit so back to the intercept katana's up um i've talked to these people i've talked to linda i've talked to the 60 minutes producer i've talked to other people who have been there and met the doctor i talked to the doctor we had a conversation with him for a, an hour a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. i'm scheduled now to go down in september i have one more thing to do a test to make sure that i'm they have to do a tv test tuberculosis. tuberculosis i have that on monday or tuesday and if i if i'm good with that then we're going to make a trip down um, my goal is to take what pain I have. I can function like on about a six or a seven pain. Some days I'm at an eight. Especially with the weather I've noticed. Yeah. And we have different climate here in the weather. Okay. Is, so yeah. the cold, how does the cold affect? Cause I, I hate the cold. We get quite cold here in, in Melbourne. So the last few weeks wake up in the morning, it's one degrees celsius or two or three um yeah. and through the day i might get to 13 or 12 or whatever and i feel way more pain and may, way more um kind of irritation on my left side than i would in summer i love summer it could be 37 mm -hmm. degrees and i'm loving it you know there's no problem so how is that dealing with the temperature fluctuation for you because you guys get really cold up there we do yeah we we get really cold in the winter minus 20 to you know celsius uh, but uh, that's not as bad as when it's around zero it's oh. more there's more moisture in the air then when oh. it's really really cold it's dry the, the humidity's not high but when it's around zero there's a lot we're right on the ocean so there's more humidity with the fog and the dampness uh -huh. that i can feel the weather before it hits the weather comes Think, or if it's raining yeah so the other day it was rainy and it was it was quite sore so if wow i can get the pain knocked down from an eight to a five or a four i can probably live fine with that like you are that's a win you know you're you're managing and so we have the resources we got a family in the states we can go down and uh, make a vacation out of it and see her her family and um, things just yeah. came together in the last last year my uh, mom passed away during all of this and uh, i know my mom would want me to have this done because every day i saw her she was always like steve how's your pain today dear and i'm like uh, you know it's all right mom she she got it um she ended up dying of uh brain cancer suddenly like it was it was within months she was diagnosed and it, and she died very peacefully she didn't suffer mm. she was able to talk to us and live comfortable life right up to the very end and she knew and she would want me to do this i feel I like know. everybody so that's what i'd like to encourage everybody to do is i know that's not within everyone's means to go and get nineteen thousand dollars worth of uh etanocept shots you know um mm -hmm. at dr tobin because i get that and that being said like I still think everybody should go after every single bit of recovery they can get from wherever they can get it and do anything they have to do to get it. 
That's why I like mm -hmm. talking about a tennis set because the podcast previously to this shares stories. It's amazing. Like it does give a lot of um, hope and support to people who have had a stroke and are learning about their condition and how people deal with it and how they might overcome it. But the really, the real thing I want to do is I want to be able to say, here's a potential solution for you or some people go and check that out. And that's why that interview that I did with um, Andrew for, oh, I spoke to him too. Yeah. Andrew's awesome. Um, that I, that I did like yeah. episode, oh man, I forget what it was now, but it's easy to find and if anyone right. wants to yeah. know what it is, they can just, they can just um, look at the show notes. So the, um, uh, so the idea is like to help people actually solve their problems. That's the whole point. And the thing about etanercept, the issues with it, you know, but this by now, but for people who are listening, who might've just come across, um, etanercept and are curious about it is that it's out of patent. So it's been used for decades, literally decades to help people treat rheumatoid arthritis and decrease the inflammation. And it's extremely well tested, but for people who are using it for rheumatoid arthritis for many, many decades, there's a low risk of causing um, uh, bleeds in the brain, I'm, I'm pretty sure, because of the use of it and the continuous use of it. It does have a, a negative effect after many, many years, and the doses that rheumatoid arthritis people get are so much higher than the doses that right. stroke survivors get, and they get over a, a prolonged period of time. So there's a little bit of concern about that. And there's no research being done. I know top, Dr. Tobinick is involved in doing a study and reporting back on the findings that he's been able to achieve through the injections that he's given so far to his private patients. Um, but there's not enough people funding studies for stroke. And there is one study in Australia that I've heard of that's being done at the moment. I'm not sure what phase it's at and whether or not they've um, been able to report positively on the outcomes um, yet. So that's the, that's the challenge with it. And for some people, it won't work. And I think I understand mm -hmm. why it won't work, right? So a little while ago, I did an awesome interview about hyperbaric oxygen therapy with um, mm -hmm. a gentleman who is a doctor who his name is Amir Hadani and the organization he works for have, uh, they have therapy centers in the United States, in Israel, and I think in one other part of the world, I'm not exactly sure now, but the difference between Dr. Amir's um, procedure and process, as opposed to Dr. Tobinix is the hyperbaric oxygen therapy center does a whole bunch of neurological scans to determine whether or not you are a candidate by looking for what they call penumbras. Penumbras are areas of the brain that are kind of switched off as a result of the injury, but are likely to switch back on once mm -hmm. the therapy is provided. And what you do is say you wanted to go and get hyperbaric oxygen therapy. It's a two month course i'm pretty sure it's a two month course daily um uh oxygen therapy and if you qualify they know that you are likely to get a positive outcome before you start the procedure so if you think about it like it makes it kind of a little more it, a little more legitimate in that I'm going there, they are going to know whether I, I'm a candidate for a positive outcome. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to do the procedure. Whereas with Dr. Tobinick, he doesn't have those facilities. They're not neurologists, they are general practitioners who yeah. um, give an injection like the general practitioner would to a rheumatoid arthritis patient. And then um, they hope for the best. And they hope that you were a candidate and that you get a result. So one other thing that people can consider, seriously consider, is hyperbaric oxygen therapy under a very controlled environment, not the kind of therapy where you can go down to the local place that's got a hyperbaric oxygen therapy tank in their clinic, right? 
Um, and then you just go there and you sit there for an hour and you pay your 80 or 100 bucks and then you leave. Not one of those where it's not monitored by doctors. This one in particular, they seem to target the same things that Etanacept's target, Etanacept targets. Although Dr. Tobinick maybe doesn't include that in the way that he describes um, the the patients who are eligible because he doesn't have that data. So this is how I've kind of understood what Dr. Tobinick is targeting, but hasn't got the data to confirm whether you're a whether you're a um a a, a a not a true candidate, but somebody who's going to likely to get good results. So basically what I'm trying to get at is the more information about your brain that you've got about the possibility of having those penumbras that are revivable, the more information you have, the better the decision that you're going to be able to make about going to Dr. Tobinick and getting a Tanisep done. What I love about Dr. Tobinick is that he's doing the things that we are, some people are begging the medical community to do for stroke survivors that they, for some reason, almost refuse not to do. Like it's so silly that there is this massive amount of data that Dr. Tobinick has been able to gain over at least nine years that I know of that he's been doing these procedures. Mm -hmm. He's got YouTube videos of hundreds of people who have had positive outcomes. And for some reason, somebody else on the planet hasn't decided to hook up with this guy and go, how can we help stroke survivors get better outcomes? Like it's so ridiculous. I cannot understand it for the life of me. No. Um, and it was the 60 Minutes crew that got involved that made me kind of think, okay, this might get some traction and might give some legitimacy to it. Um, Usually it 60 amazing. Minute crews are trying to find, you know, the snake oil salesman. They're trying to yeah, right. show you that these guys are scammers. Don't go and spend your money there. These guys are doing the exact opposite in this particular case, you know, and the person who's on the video has a perfect you know result as a uh, as a result of the injection within minutes on mm -hmm. tv yeah. and nobody else has gone oh my god right. like why don't we work with this guy and help him get more results more outcomes it's right. dumb yeah that's a conversation that i'd love to get answers for but it's it's crazy it, it, it you hear that that it's the fda it's big pharma it's all this stuff and look it's probably yeah. big pharma look it's probably big pharma in that probably. If, yeah if it was patented and they had and they owned the rights to it they would fund it no end because then they'd be able to sell it all, all around the world for stroke but yeah. the fact that they're not like i don't know i'm just glad we're talking yeah. about it again because this continues the conversation this gets more people curious and maybe right. somewhere we can start you know, chipping away at the things we need to chip away at to get the result and to get the procedure um, made available for more people and at a, at a cheaper price, right? That's really the most important thing and hopefully even get it covered by medical insurance or something. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's the thing. If, it, if more people are aware of it and it gets into the right ears and people go, ding, this, 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 people are having strokes every day and yeah, they're not going to stop. Course. No, they're not. Um, since he found all the information about Dr. Tobin, day in and day out, he's watching a reading. Day in and day out. He passes it to me or we watch it together. And yeah, at first I was like, yeah, I don't know about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just don't know about this. It sounds too good to be true, probably, and mm -hmm. just like everybody on the internet. Mm -hmm. Then I'm the type of person that started reading for myself. But after we spoke to all of these people that had good outcomes, mm -hmm. and God bless the ones that has not, mm -hmm. but the ones that had good outcomes, it gave me more encouragement that this is really what we need to do, you know? And after we spoke to Dr. Tomanik, 
with the first consultation over the phone, um, I was sold. I was sold. He and wasn't hiding anything. No, yeah. no. He, he was he was very blunt about your chances. He said, I've dealt with what you've experienced and what you're experiencing. He said, I'm not going to cure it. It may reduce it. It may be an 80% chance it works, a 20% chance it doesn't. Yeah, and there was quite a few times in the hour conversation he says, we hope it works. We mm -hmm. hope it gets you some satisfaction mm -hmm. and some pain relief, but there's no guarantees, mm -hmm. you know? And he kept saying there, there's no guarantees. So he's not hiding anything. Yeah, yeah. He's very, he wants to get, He wants. I, to I think get, if somebody came in and said, look, let's work in partnership and, and get this done. He, he wants to help us meet. He'll, he'll hand yeah. over. He's showing the videos every, every week. Or, yeah. That's the part that is interesting is that there's plenty of data, plenty of information. Um, what would be good to hear from is people who didn't get the result um, and to get like somebody like that on a podcast interview and find out from them, you know, how it was for them not to get the result. Um, I, I imagine some people are very disappointed when they go there. I'm sure. Pay the money um, and don't get the I'm result. And it, it's like I told Steve, we're, we're going to have to get the mindset that we're going to go, we're going to hope and pray for the best. That, that's our thing. We're going to hope and pray for any improvement. And if not, then at least he gave it his best shot. Yeah, I wouldn't know unless I take the shot. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, you got to do it. I, back and going, I, wonder, I wonder if it'll work. Well, that's not going to fix it. Yeah. Um, I won't know unless I take it. If it doesn't yeah. work, it doesn't work. I go on to the next hope. Yeah, I hyperbaric buy. oxygen therapy, man. No worries. Definitely, there's yeah, not. I, it's not the good. end of the road. Yeah, it's right. really good. Do you know why? Because it's not invasive at all, and it and yeah. hyperbaric oxygen therapy, when it's not done even clinically, has positive outcomes for people in their brain because the brain gets more oxygen, so your brain brain lights up. Your knees hurt less. Your back hurts less. Like it fixes all these other things that are peripherally kind of um, causing dramas. And then it's said, it, right. it, it, it may also support that other part of the brain. And it's non invasive, but I imagine it's expensive. I can't imagine it's cheap. Um, yeah, especially, especially Dr. Amir's um, process, because they are very rigorous in the way that A, they treat you beforehand, and then also in the way that they administer the therapy and right. it, you but the thing about it is you know if it's going to work for you beforehand of the in the video you see scans he shows scans um of a brain that looks like it's going to be able to be rehabilitated and then he shows the after after the therapy and how it works like so it's not all hope is not lost if a tenacep doesn't work is basically what i'm trying to get out there you know there's more right. to it um and it's just keep going after it. That's that's all I want to encourage people to do. And even if hyperbaric oxygen therapy is out of your budget, like even that, if you become a deep meditator and you learn how to breathe and do exercises with breathing, you know, Wim Hof breathing and that kind of stuff, you can improve the circulation and the blood flow and the healing in your body. So even that is not out of the question. And you can do that for free. You don't have to go anywhere. Just jump on YouTube, click Wim, mm -hmm. Wim Hof breathing, breathing method and get somebody to um, take you through that exercise for free on YouTube and you'll yeah. get outcomes. You really will. So I just want to encourage everybody to just go after all the recovery they possibly can, you know? Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's no dead ends. It's that there's always something to try. Um, yeah. Don't die it, wondering and, and be wary. That and, and you need a donor in your life to be wary and go, uh, hang on a yeah. sec. What's that junk? You know, what are you talking oh, no. about? Let's look at that deeper. You know, we can't just jump into everything without looking at it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, well, we changed our lifestyle a bit. Um, we used to be very outgoing and um, active very, outside. Very, like very, in it. Oh. very physically active. Um, we want to get back into that. That's important. Our diets have changed. We watched a lot of what we're putting into us now. Um, the stress is huge. I've let that go. I'm not mm -hmm. going back to work. If 
if everything works out, I was this close to the retirement. Yeah. I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to not let that take me down. Um, Cause so I know as soon as I, you haven't worked. As soon as I, no, no. Um, it's too physical of a job. I've been written off by the doctors saying, you know, the pain and I, they would expect me to go a hundred miles an hour again, yeah. back again. Well, right? Mentally, mentally with deadlines, yeah. like five minute deadlines before it goes to air. Yeah, there was a lot of that, but you, physically it wasn't that bad. It was all in the in the yeah. head that you it was done every day. So I've eliminated that. Eliminate. Yeah. Uh, watch the diet. Watch, you know, just start putting stress. That's the big thing. One thing I did find out though, I have in my head is something called small vessel disease. Have you ever heard of that? No. No. Tell me about it. It's well, I don't know much other than uh, that's what happened to one of the vessels in my brain when they did the MRI. It was a small vessel that burst, and the blood bleed leaked into the areas that caused the deficits that I have. Um, and with a blood pressure of two twelve, that would do it. Okay. And the other. In the hospital, we found out that he has um, a slight aneurysm in his lower descending aorta. Yes. Uh -huh. so it's okay. 40, 40 millimeters, and which our cardiologist said that if it got to 60, that that would be a little, uh, we will need to do something. But they're monitoring it. They we're doing it every six months. Now he said, we're going to stretch you since we didn't see any growth in it. We'll stretch you to a year before we, you know. So the good thing of having a stroke is now I'm taking care of myself better. Yeah. I didn't know this thing about my heart. Now I can get that checked. Um, other yeah. things that are going on in my head, managing that. But it's yeah. everybody that our story has touched. Mm -hmm that's that's now either on high blood pressure medicine or they have a machine right yeah. um everybody in my family went out and bought a blood pressure machine because the only other time you get your blood pressure is at the doctor and um, or at the pharmacy, at the pharmacy. Um, yeah. everybody all my friends are interested in or knowing like what happened and we're all on the same page uh doing the same thing why did it happen to you and not me um so they're watching their lifestyles and how they do things differently. That's good, man. That's uh, one so other good. thing I, I started to do is give back. So I found some people that, and this happened to me when I was in rehab. Part of the OT um, was uh, people who have had strokes and have recovered and wanted to come back and talk about, like, this is me five years out. When I was like you, you know, you think and you're in the hospital, oh God, you know, I'm not gonna ever be able to do this or that. Well, these guys gave you hope. And um maybe it would work, maybe it didn't. It depends on how you interpret it. One of those gentlemen and his wife were here two days after I got home from the hospital to talk to Donna about what she can expect to help you know, me get around. Um, during my stay in the hospital, we actually moved. That was planned. And we're in a place now where everything, there's no stairs or obstacles. So that was just another blessing that happened. But I'm giving back to people who want to talk about it. Like, it's, it's hard on the head, like emotionally. Oh my God, my life, especially younger people. Um, one of the guys I've reached out to I've talked to him once a month or so, and he he's having a rough go with the, with the you know his physicalness. He used to be outside doing everything, and but he realizes it's it's a day by day thing, and it's yeah. going to take time. And if you've got a good positive brain set and good people around you, hopefully you can look, put this all behind you someday. And you're not going to be perfect, and you'll have to accept that. You mentioned two chapters of my book, chapter one, mindset. And I think mm -hmm. chapter chapter eight is community, building the right community around you. you and it's to. so important. Your mindset needs to be able to focus the majority of the time on the positives and 
where you're heading and where you want to be and where you want to go. And it's allowed also to, every once in a while, get negative and think about the terrible things and all that kind of stuff, you know, because it's part of the cycle and it's part of the ups and downs. But if you spend some time there, but then spend the majority of your time focusing on your goal and not, mm -hmm. not the timeline to get to your goal, just the goal, where it is, then you're likely to move closer toward it. And also if you surround yourself with encouraging people and people who are going to support your desire to overcome things and be better, then you're more likely to get there as well. Um, because right. if you've got those, those uh, negative Nancy's around you, oh my gosh, that's even harder. I know. Yeah. And the internet's horrible. Yeah, parts of it is there. There are good, okay. there are good resources out there, but Instagram go that recovery rabbit. after stroke on Instagram. I mean, um, you come yeah. to my podcast. There's no negative Nancy's there. They're not allowed. But also, isn't it amazing? I'm followed by about five and a half thousand people. I think something like that. And I put a post up, and all you get is amazing responses about where they're at, where they're going how they're coming along. Sure, you also get the people going, I never got a good result out of that or never, but nobody comes on there and gives anybody a hard time or calls us, you know, crazy or anything yeah. like that. It's all positive. It's all about trying to put the information out there and get people over the line in something that's a difficult time. And all, my, all the questions that I ask are questions that I was curious about, or somebody has contacted me and said, can you ask the community this? Cause I want to see what happens. And we've answered questions like, do you hear voices in your ear after, after the stroke, you know? And I thought there's no way that's related to the stroke. And of course, on the stroke side, some people hear voices in their ear that aren't, aren't really there. And th at the beginning it was driving them crazy. And now they're just getting to understand it and used to it and they kind of ignore it like yeah. that's what that's what i was looking for i'm glad that that community kind of thing exists and that the podcast exists and people like you reach out to share and what's really cool is that you're doing what a lot of other stroke survivors do instinctively is immediately think about helping other people that's just brilliant to me like that's so great that we do that. I, I even catch myself out doing it, and, I, and every once in a while I go, "You never would have done that stuff before. Like, what are you doing? Who are you? Who yeah. is this person? You know, it's really awesome." I think it. Um, everything that happens to you happens for reasons, but I think it changes the perspective that you have in life. Um, but I know even like you've probably got people that don't have caregivers or that do have caregivers and and that's another aspect that it's it's hard there are days that mentally it's hard at first mm -hmm. for god the first year it was just like whoa yeah. you know how am i going to so do you do this? need that community yeah and donna yeah. without her yeah. like i wouldn't have been able to talk to you today i don't think i would have jumped out the window <laughs> or cut my leg off. <laughs> yeah. Don't go there yet. Fo no, follow, no, follow no. all those other paths. Look guys, it's been a real pleasure to chat to you both. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. I really wish you well with your upcoming procedure. Please let me know how it goes. I just, um, oh. fingers crossed that it goes well for you. Uh -huh. And, um, yeah. Thanks for reaching out. I really appreciate you sharing your story. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, we will, Bill. Thanks for having your podcast and, and helping people with this. This yeah. is great. A lot of people are going to get better with uh, the community. Yeah. And information. Thanks, buddy. Well, that's it for another episode. I hope you've found Stephen Donner's story of stroke recovery after two years as insightful and as inspiring as I did. Their perseverance through challenges like sensory overload and rehab shows the importance of support and resilience. A huge thank you to everyone who has left a review. It helps others find the podcast and it provides vital support for stroke survivors in need. If you haven't yet, please consider leaving a five-star review 
and sharing what the show means to you on iTunes and Spotify. The more people interact with iTunes and Spotify, the more Spotify and iTunes will make the podcast viewable and put it in front of people who need it. For those watching on YouTube, remember to leave a comment. I love receiving your comments and I will respond to all of them. Like the episode and subscribe to the channel to get notification of future episodes. If you'd like to support the podcast further, you can do so by subscribing to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash recovery after stroke. Your support keeps this podcast going and helps us continue sharing these powerful stories. If you're a stroke survivor with a story to share, come and join me on the show. It's a great time to join me. The interviews are not scripted. You do not have to plan for them. Just come as you are and share your experience. If you have a commercial product or a service that supports stroke recovery, consider being a part of a sponsored episode. Visit recoveryafterstroke.com slash contact. Fill out the form and we'll connect via Zoom. Thanks so much for tuning in. Your support means the world to me and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Importantly, we present many podcasts designed to give you an insight and understanding into the experiences of other individuals. Opinions and treatment protocols discussed during any podcast are the individual's own experience, and we do not necessarily share the same opinion, nor do we recommend any treatment protocol discussed. All content on this website and any linked blog, podcast, or video material controlled this website or content is created and produced for informational purposes only and is largely based on the personal experience of Bill Gassiamis. The content is intended to complement your medical treatment and support healing. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied on as health advice. The information is general and may not be suitable for your personal injuries, circumstances, or health objectives. Do not use our content as a standalone resource to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease for therapeutic purposes or as a substitute for the advice of a health professional. Never delay seeking advice or disregard the advice of a medical professional, your doctor, or your rehabilitation program based on our content. If you have any questions or concerns about your health or medical condition, please seek guidance from a doctor or other medical professional. If you are experiencing a health emergency or think you might be, call 000 if in Australia or your local emergency number immediately for emergency assistance or go to the nearest hospital emergency department. Medical information changes constantly. While we aim to provide current quality information in our content, we do not provide any guarantees and assume no legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy currency or completeness of the content. If you choose to rely on any information within our content, you do so solely at your own risk. We are careful with links we provide. However, third-party links from our website are followed at your own risk and we are not responsible for any information you find there.